Recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. Say hello to your new ma. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 293 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. On this week's show, we are going to go into a club discussion for issue number 12 of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. Then we'll go into the weekly reviews, and that's where we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old, we're going to talk about them there. But we're going to have a special little uh, promotional shout out here at the top of the show um, for a Crimson Cowl Media um, associate of ours, uh, Katie. So David Gloyd's daughter, Katie, also David Gloyd Jr.'s sister, Katie. Uh, she has created these, uh, the line of characters, a little uh, sketch cards that she does called The Specimen. The Specimen are cute little creatures documented from the strange but awesome imagination of KT, the letter K, letter T. So um, people will see the graphic on the YouTube video if you're watching. If you're listening to the audio, um, just search out for uh, The Specimen on Facebook to follow the page. And what uh, we're going to do here is kind of show off a couple that uh, I have purchased, some that uh, Kirby and Shelly have purchased. I'll, I'll, we'll just kind of just go back and forth here. I picked one up called the Weeping Slime. So a good example of these cards Ooh. here. She just does these little creatures. She's always kind of been drawing all her life, and she would just kind of always just do these randomness. But then the the bonus part is coming up with backstory. So on the back of the cards, there is information uh, giving them a specimen number. For instance, this one is 78797, the Weeping Slime. Mm. The diet is wild onions. Habitat is, while nobody knows the weeping slime's origins, it can often be found beneath weeping willows. Nobody knows why it's so sad. So that's just kind of an example. Uh, Kirby, you got some as well, if you want to show some off. Yeah, I got the most horrifying thing ever. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's kind of cute. (laughs) Nihilistic bliss is its diet habitat is neither here nor there it's an exceedingly horrifying creature few have looked upon it and survived another one i picked up was this one just called marvin and he's saying hmm marvin and uh this is very you know oddly shaped alien with some very fancy sneakers on hey Uh, that's uh, a drip another one for you kirby and then another one to com- combine with the other one is the most amazing thing ever. Hey! Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, these are definitely like a pretty hilarious kind of flip through at the convention tables, just kind of seeing <laughs> all these little creatures. Um, another one I picked up is called the Uni Whale. So there's a unicorn whale combo. I like it. That one is saying. I'm actually a narwhal, and somebody just goes, you know, whale. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a good one. Yeah, the walrus. Oh, okay. That's di- its diet is void sheep's fleece. And then whatever Sounds. else whatever else you have, fire them off. I just have the three so far. Uh, and I got Garbo the Destroyer. <laughs> I remember seeing him. Good name. He- be thankful each day that Garbo chooses to spare you. <laughs> yeah. The shifter. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. that cool. Oh, very colorful. <laughs> that one's diet is protein bars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> habitats the laboratory. And then we got the last one is bats who think they're men. <laughs> a bat with a tie on. Uh, it's a business bat. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the bat says sales are up point zero zero seven percent this quarter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and its diet is men who think they're bugs. 
<laughs> we have a whole ecosystem of of mammals that think they're other things. <laughs> so yeah, yeah these are awesome. That's just a small cool. example of the specimen by KT. And uh, I know I'm dro dropping off some uh, extra sketch cards for her to uh, make some more for the next uh, convention appearance. But once again, go to Facebook, check that out. It's a brand new uh, fan page for The Specimen by KT. Once again, the graphic will be up on the YouTube video to uh, further locate what you were looking for. But yeah, these are a lot of fun. And uh, next time you see us out at a convention, then uh, take a look at a binder of specimen. There we go. So that is a little plug there. Now we're going to jump into the show proper. So let's head over to the club discussion. All right. Uh, we're talking about the next issue of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World with issue number 12. Mason Mezzi's paths cross yet again after uh, Mace tracks her down seeking information on the Ravagers. Finding her living with a small group of ragged and sickly survivors Mace discovers Mezzi's shocking connection to the group and their world-ending machinations. As Mace sets off to fight what might be his final battle, Mezzi is faced with the most important choice she will ever make. This comic is done by Jason Aaron, Nick Dragota, Rico Renzi, Alexandre Tefenki, Lee Lauridge, Leila Del Duca, Tamara Bonvillain, and and World Design. So we are uh, within that last arc. Uh, we are told it's going to be 15 issues, at least at this moment, until we get to the end. And then they tell us, surprise, another batch. But no, th this is starting to feel like they are uh, working towards an ending here. And um, we've seen the characters separated. We've seen them go off on their own paths. And we've seen a lot more glimpses into the future, which we were teased at at the initial uh, introduction of this series. And uh, in this issue, we get to see more of uh, flashbacks from um, Mezzi and uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the group, the, uh, I can't think of the name now. Um, uh, but Rangers? With, yeah, the Rangers. So with uh, Ma and the Rangers, we have not seen them, if I'm not mistaken, for quite some time since that initial arc. So we actually kind of dip into that backstory again, kind of get a little glimpses of some scenes, some tidbits of things that, you know, information skills that that uh, she had picked up back then and is now kind of using in the adult life as she's basically uh, dealing with this uh, this constant war, this big fight now. Uh, between Mace and Mezzi. So we see a lot of arguing in this issue, a lot of uh, just back and forth and uh, standoff situations and more grim, more dark. And um, once again, ending us into a, another pecu peculiar situation of uh, where these characters are headed. So that's just kind of a quick little overview. I'll kick it over to Jim first, if you want to talk about your thoughts for issue 12 for Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. I found this a pretty slow issue for the most part because we didn't get much that we weren't expecting, weren't, wasn't new. Um, we already knew that uh, Mezzi had this relationship prior with these Wasteland Rangers. We learned a little few details about her from way back then. Uh, there was one interesting scene um, that brought her to like the current futuristic version uh, of the old lady that was uh, after she went crazy and killed a whole bunch of marauders. She decided that she was also going to end her own life and actually tried and was saved by a mass of rats who somehow adopted her as their leader and she decided that she would be their new ma. There we go, yeah. Anthony's showing us a little bit about that. And not exactly why they did that though. We don't quite know that. So that's about the only thing that was brought up in this issue that I still want to know because everything else that they gave me was 
already either told or hinted at or you could see coming whatever but that was the the new thing that was brought up so i think yeah. other than that it was a pretty slow issue yeah we just got to see some of those details kind of more so uh you know diving into the backstory more so and then any of the current timeline or future timeline whatever you want to consider it just dealing with them kind of arguing back and forth and having a standoff and just a lot of violence and them just kind of, you know, taking claim, um, you know, Mace is taking claim to, uh, <laughs> to it creating this utopia or, you know, the uh, Gorgonzola and all that stuff. And then Mezzi kind of stepping in saying like, Hey, we, we, we made this, like he's taking all this kind of credit for it. I did like the, if we were talking about flashbacks, um, so when we see the old man, uh, Mace, we see him uh, trekking along, and he's got his giant backpack again, you know, he's Reese Witherspoon style in that one movie, Wild, I think, uh, when it went all backpacking and stuff, and we had, I remember us talking about that in the, um, in that initial arc of just talking about the ridiculousness of how large that was and then we do get a little uh remembering moment of that of uh so yeah i, I did like that little callback just because i remember us kind of really calling that out and having some fun with it but yeah it uh i would agree with jim as far as you know the pace of everything just kind of being being a little slow but once again i had a very interesting ending um i think they've done really good with all the endings of these issues and uh gets me excited for the next one whether or not it picks up immediately uh which doesn't always happen but you know there's just more stories you know more issues coming yet but um seeing seeing uh some characters you know coming in and uh intervening between uh mace and mezzi during one of their arguments uh i'm i'm curious to see how that plays out that um image that you brought up about the backpack yeah um i don't know if you noticed but artistically you're looking at that image as a reflection in mace's glasses yes yeah i kind of zoomed is, in is this actually something that is happening now or is this his memory of something that, you know i i read it that just yeah. kind of kind of uh just an he's thinking, way you know memory um because yeah uh he's talking about because there is a moment in here where you know they're just at each other's throats but i think he admits about you know still having feelings for her if i'm not mistaken um i think that's the dialogue beforehand but it's it's basically you know something that he's not saying to anybody it's his own secret to kind of keep that going but he kind of thinks back to his younger self so i think that was just an artistic take on that reflection through the old man glasses there but uh that's how i read it yeah but yeah he's the one that carries all the stuff right yeah yeah, yeah. so it just kind of yeah i think it's just has a deeper meaning of the uh, yeah that, that artistic choice on that panel i really like that so how about this he's reflecting on the past and we are seeing that through the reflection yeah. of the yeah, so we do see him carrying the big pack out of other places as yeah, yeah yeah but right. uh but yeah other than that you know nothing too much you know the, all the rat stuff was pretty gruesome art wise i mean it, just, the colors are awesome i just love all that work there i'll show this pretty gruesome uh angry face here of uh, mm -hmm. uh mezzy going pretty crazy so a lot of great artwork i still continue to uh think that is happening all the way through but yep a little uh kind of a call it's weird to call this a calm issue based on the images i just shown yeah this this issue is really calm my you know then you cut to all this all these rats and stabbings and <laughs> but yeah any other thoughts you want to add to that at all there, there was one thing i was going to go back and i didn't get a chance to do it and look at some of the early issues when he was doing his tape recordings I think every time he signed off, he was signing off with his name, Maceo. Okay. He's doing one of these recordings in this issue, and he signs off as Mace. Okay. So I was just wondering if there was any meaning behind that. 
Is it just like, all right, he used to go by Johnny when he was a kid, but now he's just John? Like, is there... Or he's, is he actually a change of personality that's indicating, you know? Maybe he relates the uh, um, the mace to... Uh, Giving to, up. With the relationship, and maybe that's part of the connection with uh, Mezzi or something. Are they separated at this point? They are. And they're not at the old compound anymore where all the stuff was happening they got separated and then rejoined in the wilderness but they are not together in the wilderness they are um kind of uh competing to get to their old place um before the other one uh because his goal is to, uh, to destroy the engine that he built there that powered everything before anybody can use it to destroy the world I'll, I'll highlight this because I love uh, this kind of almost silhouette uh, in a way of Mezzi, but then there's one of the rats that's like super angry at the edge of her sword there. So I just kind of like how that one rat is portrayed in that particular panel. Has that Willard feel. <laughs> if you could notice that he has built a shotgun into his forearm. Oh, yeah. I think we were teased that at the very, very beginning, but yeah, now we're starting to see some of that stuff come to fruition. But yeah, I think that about does it. Yeah. So yeah, that is uh, issue number 12 of 15. So we'll be coming back with the future issues as they come out for this uh, uh, supposedly the final arc. I keep saying that because we just never know. They just keep deciding it's going to be longer. But yeah, so that is going to do it for that issue to uh, advertise upcoming club discussions, future issues of that series, the one shot of Tales from the North, the dungeon that we're still got to just get organized because we want to get as many people as possible that are available to talk about that. Uh, that's the Crimson Cowell Media comic book that you can uh, um, check out at the convention tables and go to crimsoncowell.com and place an order or email us and ask for it. Um, the April special, the uh, All Apes um dc comics uh special that's coming out in april and possibly banana scented if you chose that option so yeah those are some uh don't have too much going on there but uh we we'll always have room for more so that's going to do it for the club discussion let's jump over to the weekly reviews first up for me is a brand new graphic novel from faith aaron hicks hockey girl loves drama boy it should have been a night of triumph for Alex's hockey team, but when her mean girl team captain Lindsay goes after Alex with her cruelest dig yet, Alex loses what remains of her self-control and punches Lindsay out. I'll show that page uh, when I get into it. Before she, uh, before she knows it, their coach is dragging Alex off Lindsay and her invitation to the Canada National Women's U18 team's summer camp is on the line. Alex is shaken. She needs to learn how to control this anger, and she is sure that Ezra, the popular and poised theater kid from her grade, is the answer. So she asks uh, for his help, his help, but as they hang out and start to get closer, Alex learns that there is more to Ezra than the cool front he puts on, and that may be this friendship. There's a bug that just flew right in front of me. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, that maybe this friendship could become something more. This is done all by Faith Aaron Hicks, who is a creator that I follow often, and I've talked about her books, uh, Pumpkin Heads and Ride On being the um, two recent ones that I know I talked about within the last year and year or two. So this is the brand new one. Uh, I remember talking about this, seeing it in the preview catalog. And uh, just thinking that it was a funny title with Hockey Boy uh, or Hockey Girl Loves Drama Boy. And then I saw it was done by Faith Aaron Hicks. And then I'm like, yep, immediately it's a purchase. Um, this is uh, nearly, nearly 300 pages. I read this all in one sitting. That seems to be a trend with her work. Uh, this is really good. Um, we get a little introduction to both of these characters of Alex, uh, the hockey girl, and Ezra, the drama boy. Um, kind of on their separate paths in the beginning of the story. Uh, she is big into hockey. She is playing, uh, now we're going to show off that uh, punch out scene. 
So we get a lot of good action shots as far as uh, hockey goes. Faith Aaron Hicks had talked about um, being Canadian herself. She had talked about uh, getting some uh, advice or getting some, um, not editing, but basically she had friends and also a husband who kind of looked over the hockey stuff and kind of really, you know, dissected it and make sure it all kind of makes sense and flowed that she could really get that art and portray, you know, hockey uh, matches. Is that what it's called, Kirby? Hockey match, I think. Yes, that'll uh, work. A hockey match. Um, but yeah, here's the opening shot. So she has this um, this uh, team captain, who uh, Lindsay, who is just constantly degrading her and uh, putting her down. And then Alex just kind of just in the locker room, just knocks her out, gets in trouble with the coach. Mom finds out. This kind of sets the whole tone of the story. So Alex is somebody that at a young age uh, didn't really know her father. Her father had left. And... Um, she had found an interest in hockey. She loves hockey. She keeps playing it. She's obsessed with it. It's all she ever wants to do. Her mother is uh, what they call Canadian famous as far as uh, artist goes. Because uh, a lot of people will say like, hey, your mom's a famous artist. You're like Canadian famous, okay? And, um, and she's like a sculptor and things like that. So she kind of has her own path. And she doesn't have a lot of interest in what her daughter Alex is uh, doing with hockey. She actually is very much against it. She doesn't understand why she does it. She says it's not safe, kind of wants her to do an art thing, kind of follow her own path rather letting, rather than letting the child, you know, follow her own dreams. So there's a lot of that, uh, the mother-daughter uh, backlash that kind of goes on throughout the story. Um, we have the other character, Ezra, aka Drama Boy, who had just broken up with a boyfriend and he has this uh, basically has this real tight knit group of uh, theater kids and they're all prepping the, the next play and uh, the musical that's going on in school. I, I assume it's high school. Yeah. I think it's all high school. Um, and what's fun about this is that they bring in, I, I have to see if Faith Aaron Hicks just loves this or not because they are going to put on a musical performance of Little Shop of Horrors. So there's a just th a theme throughout the entire graphic novel of them, you know, building Audrey 2 and just trying to do all the stuff and get all the sets. So that was pretty entertaining just to kind of see it be very specific rather than it being like a made up play that they just make for the sake of fiction. So I liked that it had an actual, you know, musical uh, connection there. So that was fun to see that. But Alex witnesses in the beginning of the story witnesses how Ezra handles the his own mistreatment when he had broken up with his boyfriend there is like the quote unquote jock of the school who's basically you know just calling him all these bad names and you know just it's all just homophobic uh, slurs and things like that but you see Ezra, Ezra very easily shake it off and just has great comebacks and just like nothing bothers and it just like it just just washes right over him and you know the jock is just kind of stumbling over the the words and he keeps just trying to keep insulting him and Ezra it doesn't even bother him and just goes on about his life but Alex sees that and just kind of wonders like wow he's really managing his anger extremely well because there's no anger present in a situation where he's being harassed like that and that's how our characters meet at the beginning of the story, because Alex, uh, who always sort of had interest in in uh, Ezra, even though they live in different worlds of the sport world and the theater world, you know, it's very clicky and, you know, there there's a lot of di a lot of uh, commentary on, you know, the social groups of schools and stuff like that, the, the factions and everything. And that's when she just goes up to approach Ezra and kind of asks for um, some help, some tips, some guidance on how to kind of control because she feels that the next time Lindsay's going to snap at her that, you know, she already punched her out. She has a feeling it's just going to get much worse with her anger. So that is kind of the setup for the story. That is just really just the beginning, you know, chapter or two or so. Uh, the rest of the story really evolves as Ezra and Alex um kind of tease with this friendship and you kind of have the you know the flirtiness of there but you know she knows that he's gay he's got a, another you know dark secret that he kind of keeps from a lot of other people 
Um, you see a lot of the family dynamics, uh, uh, both with the mother and the fathers of both of these characters and what fell apart in in their parents uh, marriages and there's different backstories there so there's a lot of good stuff where not only are these teens dealing with their you know drama and all that stuff but uh, the parents have their own you know that they've been dealing with with uh, with their spouses and stuff like that and all of that stuff is kind of reflecting on how they approach their children whether good whether bad um this is really good i think that's all i'm going to really reveal on that um i should show some more of the art as i go through see some of the hockey action so this is done in kind of almost a black white and blue sort of uh theme here and i believe blue is the only color beyond uh your gray scales and such uh, throughout this so whether that's caps like in normal school day stuff and you know clothing items um yeah, that's the only color that's used. I don't know if that's just uh, any specific stylistic choice um, other than uh, looking at the color of her jersey on the front here. Um, so maybe that was just the whole idea all the way through, even when you get the little heart scenes and things like that. So you see those color blue. So it's a pretty entertaining uh, stylistic choice. But yeah, I, I really enjoy Faith Aaron, Aaron Hicks work. Uh, whether she's uh, doing her own, you know, where she does all the all the work on a graphic novel or she's paired with another writer. Uh, excellent stuff. And it's always going to be a constant buy regardless of the subject matter. So this is very entertaining. This is Hockey Girl Loves Drama Boy. That is from, yep, First Second. I buy a lot of books from First Second. I like what they do over there. So, Okay. Look at you, Mr. Anti-Sports, doing all these sports books lately. I know, right? <laughs> we got, well, I should get the right title, I guess. Black Ops 4, Black Ops X came in America. It's not Black Ox Ops versus them or anything like that, because they're all on the same team for the most part. But this one was a little, it's a thick end. It's a $15 book. It's got quite a bit of material in here and uh, quite a few characters. So it got a little confusing to me at sometimes with the girls because you got like three redheads, two blondes, and they just all kind of like mix in together easy enough. And my brain just doesn't <laughs> follow along as well. So I got to read it a couple times to get it. But yeah, Penelope Freeling. She's a private contractor, owner of USA GI, which is our bunny rabbit character from Black Ops. And she's the only person currently able to fully understand the carrier frequency that cryptids use. This one gets into cryptid stuff. Uh, we have USA GI, the rabbit. He's a modern cryptid and irradiated, super intelligent, highly trained leopard. America's deadliest biological agent. And we get a nice, well, not nice, but we get a story in the beginning right away. So that if you've never done anything with these characters, I think you could jump into this and this would give you enough information. But we get USA GI's origin story where he's in a laboratory and uh, one of the scientists is real close to him and doesn't like what's going on. And one day he just takes USA GI and hits the road gets the heck out of there and that's how they end up later on becoming a group of agents together we got came in america which is the alter ego of charlotte vanders exposed to extraterrestrial chimerations during a uso tour subsequently has the ability to manipulate her bioelectricity has been fighting mysterious creatures com comprised of rudimentary mud and clay origin is unknown but thought to also involve chimerations and here we this storyline we get more of those mud clay type characters that attack them and they just basically form up get broken down as they get beat up and then form up again and again just keep coming at them we got Sawyer My Milius our only male agent in this group he's army's most skilled animal trainer and comes with years of combat experience with special ops and he's the owner owner of commando g which is 
really fun to watch. She's a, a otter character that, well, I'll come across to him a little bit more. He likes to, he's an irradiated cryptid otter found after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. He's extremely deadly and ill-tempered, and he pairs up a lot of times with Riga tortoise, which is a cybernetically augmented tortoise, which has all kinds of weaponry that comes out of his shells and stuff, and Patriot Arrow to sit there and hold the shell, and then the missile launchers will pop up out of it and stuff, and then he's got like blades on the shell that can come out, and he can throw the tortoise at people and stuff. It's just fun watching them teamed up together all the time. And then the chimerations are a mysterious particle present at highly radioactive incidents that allows for multiple DNA combinations and recombinations, which allows certain creatures full access to their genetic spectrum. And it's responsible for so-called cryptids of legend, also account for humans who display extraordinary abilities. Uh, we basically know of a possible five female characters that got hit with the chimerations and were given the powers like came in America, Penelope, uh, it's Penelope, I know, but I like saying Penelope <laughs> whenever I see the Penelope name. But, uh, the cryptid sinister organization is led by Apex Moth. He's a uh, just for himself pretty much but ends up working with a couple of the girls and uh, his goal is the creation and weaponization of cryptids uses uses the private military company ninjin headed by kent kanina lovakoba to carry out its deed and she pretty much is the one running his organization tells him what to do and he just follows through but he's got his own plans and this is the the evil cryptid trio that are working their things and he comes across some type of strange hand from it's got stuff linked with certain things that we know from history and stuff i can't think of it at the at this time but it's like a healer a, an old ancient healer's hand but he sticks it on one of the girls and it instantly adapts to her hand and basically is like a like a symbiote and just basically takes over her hand and now she's able to use her hand to kind of awaken the cryptids and this whole storyline is based on them trying to wake up some cryptids and get them to basically be under their power and do what they are whatever they have planned in the future to destroy take over the world whatever but uh as that's going on they split up the group into patriot r and rigor mortis there's their little otter buddy with his little turtle rigor mortis turtle with the blades out at this moment and they go down into the tunnels into the deep part of the earth to do those missions because he can get through all the little holes and all that stuff there's a with the machine gun popping out of the turtle shell and stuff he's got rocket launchers and all all kinds of weaponry inside that turtle shell it's just amazing what comes out of there but uh they're off doing the underground stuff you got sawyer sawyer and commando g working at one area and you got penelope and usagi working on another area and at the same time our girl with the special hand she finally gets well, all of a sudden, that earth starts shaking, a bunch of stuff starts happening, and she's able to awaken one cryptid to start it all off, and it's a giant bird-type cryptid, and they can't, their powers are all, it's like pretty much earth-style powers. It's like basically one can control things on the ground, one control control things in the sky, one can control lightning, one can control fire wind and different types of things like that but uh so the people that are battling at the time only have ground powers and the one that awoke the cryptid has the air powers so they can, they gotta work out things to try and deal with this cryptid with the powers that they have but 
it's fun. It gave me more USA GI history in this book. We also even get find out about USA GI had a girl when he was a little bunny at the time and just has the girl's like ribbon that left that he's carries around with him, but it goes back to that history. So you learn about what he what he went through before he got taken by the scientist and stuff. But but yeah, this was a a lot of action, a lot of people, and it's worth it for the amount you're getting out of here. It's a nice nice long storyline in here. So it's it's worth it. Uh but yeah, I, I like the introduction to all the different characters mixed together. I've only seen them separated or a couple with one of the animal characters here and there. But yeah, I'm enjoying this Cayman American USA GI Black Ops, all that stuff. So if you like those type of things and cryptids, check that out. So it sounds like there's gonna be a lot of more big uh kaiju style cryptids coming out in the future. So cool. cool. All right, uh, my next one here from Keen Spot Entertainment. We're talking about Zor number one from the creators of Junior High Horrors, which I know Kirby has talked about, and Kung Fu Lagoon, which I know Kirby has talked about. Comes a heartfelt story that reminds you sometimes the grandest of stories happen in the tiniest of places. Mourning her mother's death, young Zoe Robertson is given a gift by her dad to always keep her mom close. However, as children do, she loses it down a sink uh, sink drain. As she cries, her tears come to life, and Zor is born. As Zor travels to find the ring, he makes new friends and must stop the evil Lady Hourglass. This comic is done by Rob Pachak and Michael Gecko Adams. Um, I picked this up because as I'm holding here on the YouTube video version, subscribe to us on YouTube to see it. Um, is the Troy Dungara cover. So friend of the show, Troy Dungara, uh, did a variant cover for this brand new series. Uh, looked pretty fun in concept, and I figure I'll give it a shot. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this. It has a very, um, very serious, touching opening story, just kind of dealing with a young girl and her father having lost the mother. And we see like a real quick like funeral scene. But it does, doesn't waste too much time to jump into kind of the, the fun adventure of what this book is built on. As uh, basically she is given this ring that they talked about in the uh, synopsis here that gets lost down the drain. And we see how that uh, takes a journey down the drain and we see it bouncing around and splishing, you know, splashing, splishing, splashing. And um, then we see out of the the tears and just the magic of fiction this character of Zor is born. Uh, Zor is basically a combination of her tears and whatever's happening down the drain and creates this uh, magical character who's just kind of on his own little mission to uh, help uh, Zoe get the ring back. Uh, so most of this book is, uh, is a fun adventure book where we see Zor down in the sewer, you know, the sewer drains and things like that and uh, fighting off some flies and some other monsters and centipedes and things like that i'll show off a couple of those designs so you can kind of see what's going on over there um a lot of fun adventure uh, all taking a place inside of a sink drain um but yeah this was this was a lot of fun i didn't i don't recall reading into the synopsis too much once i saw that there was a troy cover there i figure all right i'll give it a shot see what's going on and uh had a lot of fun with this i'm definitely going to pick up future issues of it um, don't re really want to give too much more because uh, you know, the story, um, while it's very grand on a very small scale, it doesn't span uh, a lot of time. It kind of takes place in kind of one central location. So I don't think uh, there's too much more I want to share about the actual story. But I think it's a fun, uh, kid-friendly adventure story, and kind of with a touching real-world element uh, showing the loss of a parent and uh, how the daughter reacts and has that precious item from a parent that is now lost. And uh, basically they have to wait for the plumber to get there the next day. But during that time, Zor, this brand new character, is off to kind of help find this ring himself. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was Zor number one. Okay. Um, your audio, you might be on mute, I believe, Kirby. 
and oops. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hit I a might, few more buttons, and I'll figure it out. That <laughs> might be the first time you've done that. I I've been guilty of that a couple times, but I don't I don't know. You're, you're, you you got to pass. Yeah, usually, I'm on top of it. <laughs> but I got Nodzilla number one. This is a nice thick one, also. This is by Antarctic Press, and uh, it's done by Mitch Teamley. Storyboards by Luke Minhati and art by Zumart Putra. But uh, you get a nice little history about the creator in the beginning. And he made this in his younger days. He keeps saying he got pregnant with this idea and gave birth to his little dinosaur kaiju buddy. Uh, And he had it under a different name. Someone said, you should make this a movie. He actually did get a greenlit and by Dimension Pictures, but then they ended up pulling it and doing another scary movie instead. So sadly, this didn't get put out in the early 2000s, which I would have loved to have seen instead of another scary movie. But (laughs) I've been doing lots of kaiju stuff lately, and I've been looking for the goofiest kaiju things I can find. And after Kakju and the other ones we've been coming across, they've been so much fun. And this one, it falls right along with it. It's got kind of a manga style feel to it and tons of parody. So it's like a manga parody of Kaiju's as far as, as the best way to describe it. But we get this fun character. All that, it starts out first with... Uh, a large kaiju that they're dealing with and they're preparing for everything and the scientists do some things and there ends up being an egg that gets found and from one of the kaijus and they take it they decide they're going to take it to America and while they're following all these Two scientists style people are falling in love the egg eventually hatches and we get a new baby a baby nodzilla that appears and it's just a cute little guy and he's all kinds of fun getting into all kinds of mischief and then finds a case of beer and right there and he starts gets all excited starts popping the cans drinking the beer and we find out that our kaiju uh grows from drinking beer so it ends up being just a normal kid size and human size and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing and keeps causing problems and every time it burps or farts flames come out either end (laughs) and of course with all the beer it's drinking it's doing lots of that (laughs) <laughs> we get into the military aspect of it we're gonna they're gonna try and take down not sell it and we have a cameraman on scene filming everything so we're kind of getting all these parodies talking about it's basically about the size of a man in a in a lizard suit and stuff like that and then it kept growing and growing and then you see these army tanks and army men out in the field and they're the actual toy army men (laughs) with the bases still on them and stuff like that (laughs) then our nodzilla comes in and just starts messing with it all and destroying all the military stuff missiles that are coming at him he's like well what's going on it's almost like he can talk because they're giving him dialogue underneath his grunts and groans but it's just dialogue and nodzilla's mind himself that for a minute there i'm like oh you can talk to and speak english but but yeah it, it plays out the whole king kong godzilla aspects he does the thing where he attacks the train he finds the a female and picks her up and again i'm going up to a brewery and ripping the keg off the brewery and drinking that and the brewery bat and gets bigger and bigger and then it, Here's some examples of him burping and farting. He's like pointing one way, burping. They're like, oh, at least he's not facing this way. All of a sudden, something comes out the other end. <laughs> so, but yeah, this was very goofy. 
lots of fun. I like the manga style aspect with the parody things in here. They use all kinds of weaponry trying to, trying to stop them. They got, I'm not going to ruin that part of it, what they come across to try and change them back and fix them and stop them and things. But it just, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I've been really enjoying these different goofy kaiju things. And it's, it's kind of a bummer that it didn't make it into the movie theaters, but he did have a movie theater uh, <laughs> poster that he had put in here too. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a blast. So lots of kaiju goodness in the past year. Yeah. And the world years. of like cocaine bear and stuff. I mean, this movie, this, this can come out too. So yep (laughs) okay well that is going to do it for the weekly reviews as well as the show so thank you everybody for listening or watching um get into a couple plugs here we have some upcoming events that uh members of crimson color media will be at i will be at the lucky dogs in nina wisconsin for a comic verse event sunday march 10th um I'll be there selling original art and poster prints and bookmarks and fun stuff like that. And for the first time at my solo table, I'm bringing along some copies of uh, David Gloyd and David Gloyd the Second's uh, Tales from the North, the Dungeon comic book. So I'm going to start slinging some books myself uh, on their behalf while they couldn't be there for that event. But Sunday, May 5th, uh, we will be at Madison, uh, Madison Mighty Con once again. So we'll be uh, bringing all the art and collectibles and all that kind of fun stuff. So those are some upcoming shows for Crimson Cowell Media. And um, I got some more things that are kind of lined up to announce for June and beyond. Um, go to our website, crimsoncowell.com, for info and original web comics. Crimson Cowell Comic Club on iTunes, where you can subscribe, rate, and review. Uh, that is for the audio version. But let's say you want to, uh, let's say you listen to the audio and you're just like, man, I really wish I saw some of those images from Notzilla without having to, you know, waste your time going on to Google and trying to find these images that Kirby was talking about. Well, you can subscribe to us on YouTube and you can see the video version of all these podcasts. Plus the episodes stay up on YouTube. So eventually they get removed from the the iTunes feed just due to stored space space, but on YouTube we've got them all. And so you can go on there and check that out uh, by subscribing to Crimson Cowl Comic Club over on YouTube. Uh, the Crimson Cowl, all one word on Instagram. If you want to email us, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at Yahoo.com. Kirby has a spin-off podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Is there anything you want to talk about that just came out or what's on the horizon? I got lots of reviews, previews, and all that unpacking's going on right now. We're starting up the reviews over the next week to two weeks. We'll probably get through all the reviews that I'm going to do individually from the Might- Milwaukee Mighty Con that we picked up and stuff. And yeah, there's been lots of fun. So check those out and lots of interesting stuff on its way. So well, cool. So yeah, subscribe to Under the Call of MS wherever you get your podcast as well as on YouTube and Instagram. All right. Uh, I have some art accounts over on Facebook and Instagram under my name, Anthony Latch, L-A-A-T-S-C-H. I have almost daily postings of uh, art that I've been drawing. I've finally been releasing my Selena Plus Chef series. So by the time people see this video or hear the audio, uh, all of those will be up. I think I have seven of them in this first round where I pair Selena Gomez up with a bunch of uh, fictional chefs. So it's been a lot of fun. I have one more to post as of this recording. Um, Cartoonist by Night is a drawing show that I host. And we just released a brand new episode. And oh, yeah, here's what I had to show. And our guest is Eric Wolfgang, who is the artist on Super Fun Altogether. I talked about this book um, on this very podcast a couple weeks back, maybe a month ago at this time. But Eric Wolfgang joins myself and D. Brad Gibson for an episode just kind of talking about randomness and mostly learning about Eric Wolfgang. Um, show off a lot of the commissions that uh, myself and Kirby have always talked about him over the last handful of years. 
and he reveals that he has a, a brand new sketch cover commission list that he's doing. He has a partnership with uh, CGC to get stuff graded. Uh, go to uh, his website, which is ericwolfgang.square.site, and you can go there for the information on original sketch cards uh, where you can buy. You can buy other artwork he's got on there. Um, as well as this brand new uh, sketch cover thing that he's doing throughout the year. Uh, but check out his episode on Cartoonist by Night, available on YouTube. It was definitely a fun time. And uh, we have our guests lined up for recording um, this coming Wednesday at the time of we're recording this now. Very excited about this guest, and uh, I'll reveal that to the people uh, here when we stop recording. Um, but yeah, so just subscribe to Cartoonist by Night on youtube um that's gonna do it then oh yeah and then the final do another uh plug to come full circle on katie's specimen so check out the specimen over on facebook to see uh what uh kt has been doing with these awesome creatures and these fun little sketch cards so follow the page and help that page grow and spread awareness of these creatures that come from her brain and jump over to a little collectible card that is going to do it then for this episode this entire time i've been treasuring my original sketch from ramona Freden. i've been hopping up the hops with notzilla i've been drinking beer with kaijus this is not mace or maceo to be continued <laughs>